Hello everybody, I'm Raphael Perry, and as some of you are very aware, as I've mentioned in the last few videos now, this weekend I shall be attending Fighting Fantasy Fest 2019, but also known as Fighting Fantasy Fest 3, the third one that is, the free Fs, and I thought what better way to celebrate that than to revisit one or more good old fighting fantasy classics. Now then, I'm just going to play for a little bit. Now, I don't know how long the episode's going to go. I mean, I've, I've got a clock here just in case I need to keep track of time. But basically, I'm going to play for a while before heading out to market to purchase provisions for my quest. And I am on a very specific quest this year. For I have been reliably informed that the Fighting Fantasy miniatures produced by Pure Evil Miniatures, well, sculpted by Pure Evil, Mini Evil Miniatures, but now available by Atlantis Miniatures, who do really gorgeous miniatures, by the way. I'm still painting up some of their dwarfs from a previous Kickstarter. It's got, like, amazing stuff. Uh, yeah, so I've been reliably assured that the Fighting Fantasy miniatures, sculpted, I believe, by Damien Sparkles of Pure Evil Miniatures, will finally be available to purchase. And I am that excited and enthusiastic gentleman who took some photographs and, as of yet, unshared video footage of the miniatures four years ago. And I've been wanting to purchase them ever since. Now, I'm going to be honest, I want all of them, but I think I worked out that to purchase the entire range would cost me about £230, and that is more than I can comfortably afford to spend. So I will be taking my coins of the realm and purchasing selectively. I understand they'll be heading to Kickstarter later, and that's great, but obviously I want to get them now. I've been waiting a really long time, so my quest shall not be in vain. All of this time, all of this waiting, all of this dedication will finally pay off. Now, I'm going to play one of these gorgeous old Fighting Fantasy game books collected in the Fighting Fantasy Classics collection. Um, my personal favourite is Forest of Doom. However, last time I played, I was playing City of Thieves and came off a cropper against two of the Troll Town Guardsmen. So this time, I'm going to go with Death Trap Dungeon, because, to be honest, while Forest of Doom was my personal favourite, the general favourite of the Fighting Fantasy fans was a toss-up between Warlock of Firetop Mountain and Forest of Doom, uh, Death Trap Dungeon. So yeah, let's go for it, okay? Mmm. Now, do you want a rule summary? I mean, I'm going to be relying on like 30-year-old memories here, maybe 25, 30-year-old memories of Death Trap Dungeon, which means I can only remember about 40 to 50% of the dungeon. After that, it's going to get a bit hazy, okay? <laughs> or that is 40 to 50% of my preferred route through the dungeon. Hmm. Death Trap Dungeon is a fighting fantasy game book, an interactive adventure in which you are the hero. You can only win by choosing the correct path, finding equipment, avoiding traps, and surviving combat. You will need to be as wise as an owl and as cunning as a weasel to triumph over the challenges ahead of you. Before embarking on your adventure, you must determine your own strengths and weaknesses with a series of dice rolls. You have been preparing for your quest by training yourself in swordplay to improve your skill and exercising vigorously to build up your stamina. Before making your rolls, you must choose from one of three difficulty settings. This gamebook has been designed for optimum challenge and the adventurer difficulty mode. For newcomers to Fighting Fantasy, we recommend adventurer or free read modes. For experienced readers already familiar with printed versions of this gamebook, we recommend Hardcore Hero Mode. Absolutely! Uh, I'm, I'm just gonna... Uh, right, so free read, you get to read, don't need to roll any of the dice. Adventurer Mode, it's a bit easier. Oh! Adventurer Mode, 
and hardcore hero you have less skill. Still receive unlimited bookmarks. Okay. You have chosen the Hardcore Hero difficulty mode. Before continuing, you must calculate your initial stamina. Whatever happened to rolling skill before stamina? It was always skill, stamina, and luck. I don't know why they started in the reprints placing stamina before skill. That's a little weird. Your stamina score reflects your general constitution, your will to survive, your determination, and overall fitness. The higher your stamina score, the longer you will be able to survive. You must roll two dice and add 12 to the number rolled. This is then entered in the stamina box on your character sheet. Stamina can go, will go up and down during your journey, but if your stamina falls to zero, you die and your adventure is over. Absolutely. Good old hardcore. Oh, right. Ugh, a little on the low side. You're on a five plus a base of 12 means your stamina is 17. Perhaps an ailing hero. Next, determine your skill. Your skill reflects your swordsmanship and general fighting expertise. The higher, the better. Your starting skill is determined by rolling one die and adding four to the number, as opposed to the default one die plus six in the original game books. This is then entered into the skill box on your adventure sheet. Your adventure sheet can be accessed at any time using the menu at the bottom of the screen. I think there's a drag up. Um, nope, that's not it. No, that's not... Oh dear, that's a problem, isn't it? Okay, back in we go. Come on. I will remember how to get it back. Hmm. Anyway, let's roll for skill. Oh, nice. A five and four is nine, which would have been kind of average-ish on the old, but now we determine luck. Your luck score indicates how naturally lucky a person you are. Luck and magic are facts of life in the fantasy kingdom you are about to explore. Your starting luck is determined by rolling one die and adding six to the number. This is then entered in the luck box on your adventure sheet. Luck is fairly important. Ah, ten. Nice. So, the reason luck is important is that every time luck is used, it decreases. Therefore, essentially, your luck will run out the more you push your luck. <laughs> Next time you must use choose a potion. Next you take a po yeah. In addition to your other starting equipment, you may take one bottle of a magical potion which will aid you on your quest. Each potion contains enough for one measure, so use it wisely. The potions of skill and strength will fully restore your skill or stamina points, respectively. The potion of fortune will add one to your initial luck before fully restoring your luck points. Which potion will you take on your quest? Right, now. There are generally, in fighting fantasy books, not a lot of things that will reduce your skill. However, the things that do reduce your skill will do so permanently, be, uh, permanently and be extremely painful and crippling if you have no way of fixing them. Potion of Strength, it's a total heal, full heal, all health restored. Really useful. Potion of Fortune restores all spent luck points, and bear in mind every time you test your luck. Gotta spend a luck point. And gain an extra one as well. I'm actually going to go for the Potion of Fortune this time. Yes, I will take that. Next, you must prepare your adventurer's equipment. You begin your adventure with a sword... Leather armor and a backpack containing provisions, food and drink to sustain you during your journey. Rationing your provisions is key to a successful adventure. It's also key to a ridiculously long coach ride at about half past five in the morning, followed by trying to remember how to navigate my way around London when I haven't been there in about two years and haven't been there properly in about 36 years. <laughs> Maybe we can see, yeah. Rationing your provisions is key to a successful adventure. They may be consumed at any time, excluding combat, by accessing the adventure sheet. Each meal restores four stamina. Be sure to pay close attention to your stamina and restore it regularly. Your difficulty setting determines how many provisions you begin with. Adventurers and free readers start with ten which was the default in virtually all fighting fantasy books back in the day. 
while hardcore heroes begin with free. In other words, you are well screwed, mate. You should have taken the potion of stamina. I don't know. I'm so happy I took the potion of luck. Hoping it will hold out for me there. In fact, the reduced skill and rations really lead towards the potion of strength. Lean towards the potion of strength, that is. During your quest, you may encounter characters and items that alter your free scores. Skill, stamina and luck. I'm putting them in the correct order. <laughs> Usually these scores may only ever be restored to their initial amount. On very rare occasions, a particular page may grant an effect that defies this rule. Aside from these occasions, some magic items may also allow you to exceed your initial scores. Once you have readied your equipment, you may begin. May the luck of the gods go with you on the adventure ahead. And may our stamina never fail, even if we only have 17 points. Ah, here we are. Uh, so, yeah, those of you expecting this to have a lot in common with the Death Trap Dungeon computer game, ironically, yes, Ian Livingston, the author of Death Trap Dungeon, did own the company who made the Death Trap Dungeon computer game, and Lara Croft and all the Tomb Raider games and some other things. I think he still owns that company, actually, or did until a year or two ago, maybe he might have stepped down um, to focus on other endeavours. However, the Death Trap Dungeon game was based on the original game book in about as much as Hollywood movies with the words based on below the title and they'll be like based on the book, based on this other film or something. Bear beyond a few character names a tangential relation at best to the original source material. So, the computer game was extremely challenging. I wasn't able to complete the last one or two levels of it, actually. Uh, it, it featured lots of guns and rocket launchers and things that didn't quite feel right for the continent of Alansia on the world of Titan. And there were lots of clowns for some reason. But there were some ridiculously difficult uh, platforming challenges towards the end. And of course, after Death Trap Dungeon was Trial of the Champions, in which Baron Sukhumvit's evil brother... Don't get me wrong, Baron Sukhumvit, totally evil, but his evil brother, also evil. So his evil brother, whose name I can't remember, decided to create a... either create a rival dungeon, or a... Or a champion to send in to try and complete the new Death Trap dungeon. To rub it in his brother's face and go, no, 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 see, I did it, I won your competition, so there. You've got to give me all the prize money. Because you're supposed to be entering as a slave. But yes, so the computer game had the the concept of Baron Sukhumvit with his Death Trap dungeon and the 10,000 gold pieces prize money. And, and it had the... The, uh, the Pit Fiend, and beyond that, that was about it as far as similarities went. Anyway, let us begin. I've been waffling for too long. And if I seem a little short of breath at times, that's obviously because of my asthma kicking in. So, uh, some of these sentences may be a little long for me. Despite its name, Fang was an ordinary small town in the northern province of Chiang Mai. Situated on the banks of the River Kok, it made a convenient stopover for river traders and passengers throughout most of the year. A few barges, rafts, and sometimes even a large sailboat could usually be found moored at Fang. But all that was long ago, before the creation of the Trial of Champions. Now, once a year, the river is crammed with boats as people arrive from hundreds of miles around hoping to witness the breaking of an ancient tradition in Fang and to see a victor in the Trial of Champions. Each year, warriors and heroes come to Fang to face the test of their lives. Survival is unlikely, yet many take the risk for the prize is great. 
a purse of 10,000 gold pieces. That's going to be a pretty whopping great big purse. And the freedom of Chiang Mai forever. However, to become a champion is no easy task. Some years ago, a powerful baron of Fang called Sukumvit decided to bring attention to his town by creating the ultimate contest. Uh, apparently there's a Sukhumvit road in, um, in Thailand, I think it is. But anyway, uh, there, there's a whole reason for that. Okay, there's, there's a massive story behind a lot of the inspiration for this book, but yeah. Um, hmm. With the help of the townspeople, he constructed a labyrinth deep in the hillside and then probably killed the builders so they couldn't tell anyone what they had built. With the help of the townspeople, he constructed a labyrinth deep within the hillside behind Fang, from which there was only one exit. The labyrinth was filled with all kinds of deadly tricks and traps and loathsome monsters. Sukhumvit had designed it in meticulous detail so that anybody hoping to face its challenge would have to use their wits as well as weapon skill. When he was finally satisfied that all was complete, he put his labyrinth to the test. He picked ten of his finest guards, and fully armed, they marched into the labyrinth. They were never seen again. The tale of the ill-fated guards soon spread throughout the land, and it was then that Sukhumvit announced the first trial of champions. Messengers and news sheets carried his challenge. Ten thousand gold pieces and the freedom of Chiang Mai forever to any person surviving the perils of the labyrinth of Fang. The first year, seventeen brave warriors attempted the walk, as it later came to be known. Not one reappeared. As the years passed and the trial of champions continued, it attracted more and more challengers and spectators. Fang prospered and would prepare itself months in advance of the spectacle it hosted each year. The town would be decorated, tents erected, dining halls built, musicians, dancers, fire eaters, illusionists and every sort of entertainer hired, and entries registered from hopeful individuals intent on making the walk. The week leading up to the festival found the people of Fang and its visitors in wild celebration. Everybody sang, drank, danced, and laughed until the day of the trial broke and the town thronged to the gates of the labyrinth to watch the first challenger of the year step forwards to face the trial of champions. Having seen one of Sukhumvit's challenge flyers nailed to a tree, you decided that this year you will attempt the walk. For the last five years you have been attracted to it, not for the rewards, but for the simple fact that nobody has ever yet emerged victorious from the labyrinth. You attend, intend to make this year. You intend to make this the year in which a champion is crowned. Gathering up a few belongings, you set off immediately. Two days' walk takes you west to the coast, where you enter the cursed Port Black Sand. Ah, Port Black Sand, we know it well. A haunt of many a ne'er do well. Wasting no time in that city of thieves, you buy your passage on a small boat sailing north to where the river cock meets the sea, and from there you raft upriver for four days until you finally arrive in Fang. The trial begins in three days' time and the town is in an almost hysterical mood of excitement. You register your entry with the officials and are given a violet scarf to tie around your arm, informing everyone of your status. For three days you enjoy Fang's greatest hospitality and are treated like a demigod. During the long merriment you almost forget your purpose in Fang. But the evening before the trial, the magnitude of the task ahead begins to dominate your thoughts. Later, you are taken to a special guest house and shown to your room. There is a splendid four-poster bed with satin sheets to help you rest, but there is little time left for sleep. Just before dawn, a trumpet call awakens you from vivid dreams of flaming pits and giant black spiders. Minutes later, there is a knock on your door, and a man's voice rings out, saying, The challenge begins soon. Please be ready to leave in ten minutes. 
You climb out of bed, walk over to the window and open the shutters. Already people are thronging the seats, moving quietly through the morning mist. Spectators on their way to the labyrinth, no doubt hoping to find good vantage points from which to watch the competitors. You turn away and walk over to a wooden table on which your trusty sword lies. You pick it up and cut the air with a mighty sweep, wondering what beasts its sharp edge may soon have to meet. When you open the door into the corridor, sorry, then you open the door into the corridor, a small man greets you with a low bow as you emerge from your room. Please follow me, he says. He turns to his left and walks quickly towards the stairs at the end of the corridor. Leaving your guest house, he darts down narrow alleyways between houses and you have to walk quickly to keep up with him. Soon you come into a wide dirt road lined with cheering crowds. When they see your violet scarf, they cheer even louder and start to shower you with flowers. The long shadows cast by the people in front of you shrink as the bright yellow sun rises higher in the morning sky. Standing there in front of a noisy and vibrant crowd, you feel strangely alone, aware of your coming ordeal. Suddenly you feel a tug on your shirt and you see your small guide eagerly beckoning you to follow him. In case you'd forgotten. Ahead you see the looming hillside and the dark mouth of a tunnel disappearing into its inner depths. As you get closer you notice two great stone pillars on either side of the tunnel entrance. The pillars are covered with ornate carvings, writhing serpents, demons, deities, each seeming to scream a silent warning to those who would pass beyond them. And here we have the beautiful old illustration of this little chap who's really getting into it. I think he must be our guide. I honestly never considered him possibly being the guide before. We have some townspeople, some other contestants, statues, and of course, Baron Sukumvit himself. Oh yes. You see Baron Sukumvit himself standing by the entrance waiting to greet the contenders in the trial of the champions. You count five others standing proudly in line, their violet scarves displayed for all to see. There are two bare-chested barbarians dressed in furs. They stand completely motionless, legs straight and slightly apart, arms thrust forward to rest on the hilts of their long, double-headed battle axes. A sleek elven woman with golden hair and feline green eyes is adjusting the cross belt of daggers wrapped around her leather tunic. Of the two remaining men, one is covered from head to foot in iron plate armor with a plumed helmet and a crested shield, the other is clothed in black robes, only his dark eyes showing between the swathes of his black face scarves. Long knives, a wire garrote and other silent death weapons hang from his belt. He's a flippin' ninja! The five contenders acknowledge your arrival with almost imperceptible nods of the head, and you turn to face the exultant crowd for the last time. Suddenly, a hush falls over the crowd as Baron Sukumvit steps forward holding six bamboo sticks. You draw one from his outstretched hands and read the word, Fifth. Then the trial begins. The knight is first. He salutes the crowd before disappearing into the tunnel, and is followed half an hour later by the elf. Next goes a barbarian, then the dark assassin. Now it is your turn to salute the crowd. Holding your violet scarf aloft, you take one final deep breath of cool, fresh air before turning to pass between the stone pillared gateway into Sukumvit's corridors of power to face unknown perils in the walk through the Baron's mighty death trap dungeon. The clamour of the excited spectators gradually fades as you venture deep into the gloom of the cavern tunnel. Uh, can I get classic view on here? Um, let's see what I can do here. Hmm. Yeah. Retro mode. Oh, we got hoodie bloke. Scary, of course. Um, audio. 
Oh, we're good. Ow! Whoops. So yeah, I apparently just closed the game. Sorry about that. <laughs> what an options menu. Oh dear. Yeah, man. Yes, absolutely. Well, I'm just wondering why I don't seem to be able to see the um, section numbers yet. Because this should be section one. The clamour of the excited spectators gradually fades as you venture deep into the gloom of the cavern tunnel. Large crystals hang from the tunnel roof for 20 meter intervals, radiating a soft light just enough for you to see your way. As your eyes gradually become accustomed to the near darkness, you begin to see movement all around. Spiders and beetles crawling up and down the chiseled walls disappear quickly into the cracks and crevices as they sense your approach. Rats and mice scurry along the floor ahead of you. Droplets of water drip into small pools with an eerie plopping sound which echoes down the tunnel. The air is cold, moist and dank. After walking slowly down the tunnel for about five minutes you arrive at a stone table standing against the wall to your left. On it there are six boxes, one of which has your name painted on its lid. I could open the box or I could not open the box. I shall open the box. I believe I have been handed a key. No? What happened to the key? That's weird. The lid of the box lifts off easily. Inside you find two gold pieces and a note written on a small piece of parchment addressed to you. After placing the gold in your pocket you read the message which says well done. At least you have the sense to stop and take advantage of the token aid given to you. Now I can advise you that you will need to find and use several items if you hope to pass triumphantly through my death trap dungeon. Signed, Sukumvit. And in the old classic book of the mi uh, of the old classic book, beneath this was written in capital letters, Get No Mess. This was a vital clue, because it was an anagram of the words gemstones. We will need to acquire some gemstones to unlock the gate at the final end of the labyrinth. Uh, I believe we're going to need a emerald, a diamond, and either a ruby or a sapphire. However, one of them, I know we need the emerald, but there are one or two trick gems we do not need. Memorizing the advice of the note, you tear it into tiny pieces and continue north along the tunnel. Hey, we have numbers! After walking down the tunnel for a few minutes, you come to a junction. A white arrow painted on one wall points west. On the floor, you can see wet footprints made by those who entered before you. It is hard to be sure, but it looks as though three of them followed the direction of the arrow while one decided to go east. Now at this point, I would like to point out that I will be using the Fighting Fantasy rule. Now the most important thing to know about the Fighting Fantasy rule is that it is a default, not a hard and fast overriding rule. Uh, as in, the Fantasy Fantasy rule applies if you have no good reason to do something else. So for example, if you're chasing a figure down a hallway and he turns left, you don't automatically turn right because you saw him turn left, you know. Uh, so generally the fighting fantasy rule, if you are given physical directions, you go straight ahead. If you can't go straight ahead, you go left. If you're given compass directions, you go north, and if you can't go north, you go east. Now, this applies to about two-thirds to three-quarters of the old fighting fantasy series. Not so much for newer books. At about the, around the, the late 20s in the old book numbers, so the old book numbers went up to about 56, right? So for the first 20-something um, books, 20 to 30 books, the fighting fantasy rule was fairly reliable. In some books, however, and for most of the 
30 something number books and some of the 40 books the reverse fighting fantasy rule applied which was if you're given physical directions you go straight ahead if you can't go straight ahead you go right instead of left and if you're given compass directions you always go south and if you cannot go south you go west now of course with the fighting fantasy rule if you are heading on a journey southwards then always trying to head north is not very helpful but then again it's it's a default rather than a a hard rule to live by so we will head west three of our compatriots well three of our competitors have headed west one is headed east this means that if we run into them there's less trouble to run into heading east and also that arrow probably a trap ahead you can see a large obstruction on the tunnel floor although it is too dark to make out exactly what it is the wet footprints you have been following carry on towards the obstruction we can continue this way or head back we will continue you see that the obstruction is a large brown boulder like object you touch it with your hand and are surprised to find that it is soft and spongy. I'm not going to attack it with my sword because it's like a giant poison puffball and poisonous spores go off in my face. I will try and climb over it. You clamber onto the soft boulder, half expecting to be engulfed by it at any moment. Getting over it is difficult as your limbs, limbs sink into its soft casing, but eventually you manage to struggle over it. Relieved to be back on firm ground you head east the tunnel makes a sudden turn to the left and heads north for as far as you can see the, footpr the footprints you are following start to peter out as the tunnel becomes gradually drier soon you are beyond the dripping roof and the pools on the floor you notice the air becoming hotter and find yourself panting even though you are walking quite slowly in a small recess on the left-hand wall, you see a section of bamboo standing on its end. Lifting it down, you see it is filled with clear liquid. Your throat is painfully dry and you feel a little dizzy from the heat in the tunnel. I think we could do with some serious hydration. The water in the bamboo pipe is welcomingly refreshing. You gain one stamina point. Now, that will not take us above our maximum, but had we been poisoned by the giant puffball, regaining a point here would have been very useful. It, it also contains a magical solution, which will enable you to be exposed to melting point temperatures without harm. Discarding the bamboo, you set off north again in good spirits. The temperature continues to rise and you find yourself dripping with sweat. As you struggle on, the heat intensifies until it feels like a white heat and becomes so unbearable that you begin to pass out. We have drank from a bamboo pipe. Now, if I was in free read mode, even if I had not drank from a bamboo pipe, I could pretend that I have, but I've got to be honest here, hey, I'll take the only option available to me. Although the temperature in the tunnel is higher than you could normally tolerate, the liquid from a bamboo pipe keeps you alive. I am extremely grateful. Mercifully, the temperature now starts to drop rapidly and soon it feels almost cool again. On the left hand side of the tunnel is a closed door. It is a small plate in it which you might possibly slide open. Yes. So another thing in Fighting Fantasy, remember, investigate almost everything. I say almost everything. If you're playing Temple of Terror, do not investigate everything or you will die. There's literally a trap where you die if you investigate too many things. The plate slides open easily and you find yourself peering into a room with a deep pit in the floor behind the door. On the opposite wall there are two iron hooks, on one of which hangs a coil of rope. Do you wish to open the door, jump over the pit and take rope? Yes, absolutely! The door swings open into the room and you step back and jump over the pit. Had we not opened the plate and looked through, we would have opened the door, stepped through, fallen in the pit. You put the rope in your backpack and jump back across the pit to leave the room and head north. We now have rope. And apparently orcs. Yes, a coil of rope. Look at that orc. 
Look at his savage, cruel face and his big mor morning star. And there's a second one behind him. Oh, nasty. Just like they've been playing Hero Quest or something. Ahead, you see that the tunnel turns sharply to the left. You turn the corner and almost bump straight into two fierce looking orcs armed with morning stars and wearing leather armour. You are totally unprepared. They're wearing leather armour? Where? I mean, he's got a helmet on, that doesn't even look like leather. I suppose there's a little bit of leather here? That's not really armour, though. It's, it's not enough for armour. You are totally unprepared and draw your sword. One of them swings his morning star at you. Roll a die. Absolutely. Oh my goodness, that's going to hurt. Oh well. Uh. The orc's morning star fuds into your arm, knocking your sword to the floor. You must fight him barehanded, reducing your skill by four for the duration of the combat. Fortunately, the tunnel is too narrow for both orcs to fight you at once, but even so, that's going to hurt a lot with reduced skill on this hardcore difficulty. Oh well. Looks like we're even Stevens on the skill front. Let's go for it. No, 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 I'm going to fight on. Uh, so remember, in this kind of situation, you only really want to use where you have a massive stamina advantage and not a big skill advantage. You're using stamp, using luck for survival rather than to deal damage. There we go, he can't last too much longer now. Yeah, we'll just take the damage and move on. Oh, wait, yeah. The temptation to use luck at... Got him! You have defeated the first orc. Now you must face the second orc. Now he's a better fighter, so we may want to use luck here to try and finish him off. Now is luck going to do an extra one or two damage? It used to be two normally, but... Okay, that's a draw. Oh, we're taking a hit here. Okay, fine. Got him, and now we will use luck. It's rare that I would use luck in combat, to be honest. But in a situation like this, where we were on a rapid decline, we kind of had to. You're lucky, your weapon hits hard. Do two more damage. What a voluminous fanfare. My poor ears. <laughs> Inside one of the orc's pockets you find one gold piece and a hollow wooden tube. You put your findings in your backpack and set off west, but not before munching down on some provisions. Yeah, absolutely. That'll take us back to full health. As you walk along, droplets of water again start falling from the tunnel ceiling. You see wet footprints made by the same boots that you followed earlier heading west. The footprints lead to a closed iron door in the right-hand wall of the tunnel, but do not seem to go any further. Then we shall open the door and see what lies within. The door opens into a large chamber where you are shocked to see one of your rivals who had obviously met a sudden, gory death. It is one of the barbarians and he is impaled on several long iron spikes which are fixed to a frame that is sprung out of the floor. Look at that hideous way to die. And yet I see a chalice. A lot of rubbish and debris litters the floor, concealing a hidden tripwire which he must have stepped on and thus released the spiked frame. In the far wall is an alcove in which you see a silver goblet standing on a small wooden table. The goblet's probably, it's probably like a poison dart trap as well or something. Will you walk over and search for Barbarian? Walk towards the deck. We'll search for Barbarian. Because while he is on a trap, he doesn't have a trap on him, if you know what I mean. The pouch from the Barbarian's belt is empty, apart from some strange-looking dried meat wrapped in cloth. Um, we could eat that, I suppose, and hope it won't... You know, we hope our civilised palate will be able to handle it. The meat contains herbs, which will increase your strength. You gain free stamina points, and that... I shouldn't have eaten our food now. 
Oh, well. Uh, what would you like to do now? We will walk over and inspect the alcove. You walk slowly over to the alcove, carefully checking the floor for any more hidden traps. You see that the goblet contains a sparkling red liquid. Uh, we could drink it. But it... I think it's poisoned, and... I think the food on the Barbarian was for real treasure here, and also we're on full health at the moment, and the inability to take it with us... Yeah, let's just leave. Let's go. We'll leave the chamber and continue west. The passageway soon leads to a junction. You notice more footprints on the floor, possibly as many as three pairs heading north from the south passage. You decide to follow them. And of course, the classic chamber. The passage opens out into a wide cavern, which is darker, but much drier. Ahead, you see the footprints gradually fade, then disappear. There is a large idol in the centre of the cavern, standing approximately six metres high. It has jeweled eyes, each as big as a fist. There are two giant stuffed bird-like creatures standing on either side of the idol. These are very big birds. They are so big they might even know the way to Sesame Street. But this statue, look at the treasures glinting. And you see the extra glint coming off the statue's right eye there, nothing on the left eye. I know the authors claim there were never any clues hidden in the illustrations, but there was at least one book with a illustration related clue or puzzle, maybe a few more. And this here always looked like a small worshipper kneeling before a vast statue to me, even though it's just a rocky formation. We will climb the idol and take one of the jewels. And this is one of those instances where the fighting fancy rule does not apply. The idol is very smooth and will be difficult to climb. Do you have any rope? Yes, we do. You make the rope into a lasso, whirl it round your head and throw it at the idol's head, smiling happily as it falls around its neck. It's like he has a string tie. You then tighten the noose and start to climb, hauling yourself up the rope. You are soon at the top of the idol, sitting on the bridge of its nose and holding onto the rope. You draw your sword and wonder which eye to prize out first. Now, fighting fancy rule does not apply here. The left eye... is a fake. It is a glass lens covering a a hollow full of poisonous gas which is lethal whereas the right eye is the safe one to take and a genuine gemstone. Oh no I was wrong! <laughs> you try to force the point of your sword under the emerald eye. Much to your surprise, the emerald shatters on contact, releasing a jet of poisonous gas straight into your face. The gas knocks you out and you release the rope, bouncing down the idol and crash onto the stone floor. Your adventure ends here. The end. I should have trusted him a fighting fancy rule. For some reason, I think in the old game book, it might have been the other way around, but maybe my memory's playing tricks on me. I don't know. Anyway, I've been playing for quite some time. I hope you've all enjoyed this video, and I may do some more Fighting Fantasy videos again in the future. But for now, I think it's time for me to end the episode here. I hope you've all enjoyed this one, and I'll look forward to seeing you all in the next one. I'll say bye-bye for now, and cheerio!